Hey, it's Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And today I'm going to talk about why I backed Trudbang Legends. Because it's from Kaman. That's basically it. It's been fun, everyone. Uh, you can subscribe down below. Click the button. Tell me why you backed this game. Why did you like it? What about the game pulled you in? For me, it was pretty simple. Kaman puts out game. I simple man. I back Kaman game. That's pretty much it. It's it. It's over. And until next time, have a good one. Now, before we get into the real video, if you're wondering why there's a duck behind me, you should watch my video from Sunday. That will answer a few questions. Or why there's a giant duck behind me. As far as Trudvang Legends, despite my whole, you know, little come on fanboy thing I just did, it, realistically, this is one that I actually walked into the campaign expecting to not back. I walked into Trudvang Legends expecting to not back it. Every once in a while, there's a come on game that doesn't pull me in. Munchkin Dungeon is one I skipped on. I eventually got it later because my wife wanted it, and so I got it. But there are come on games. Arcadia Quest, anything to do with Arcadia Quest, I pass on. It's not a game for me. I skip Star, Star Arcadia Quest. I skip Arcadia Quest. It doesn't, doesn't, just doesn't work for me. Uh, sometimes they do the Night of the Living Dead. Zombicide Night of the Living Dead is one I passed on because I like Zombicide. I just didn't feel the value was there. So despite being a, a fan of come on games, and despite backing a majority of them, there are those that I do pass on. And Trudvang, I thought, was going to be one of them. I did. When I first heard about the game, when I, the more I looked into the game, the more I was like, you know what? This art, this style, this this promise of a story narrative game is just not something that's for me. Between the, the art not pulling me in, between it being pitched as a narrative game, that is something that's usually not up my alley. But as the campaign, you know, came out, and uh, first of all, they had an early bird pledge, so I hopped on that day one, because of course, hop on the early bird pledge and then see how the game plays out. But then the more the campaign went on, I had a reminder set to cancel before the campaign ended, but I, I didn't. I got pulled in more and more, and we'll talk about why as we go through this video. Now, I will note, this game, Trudvang Legends, does have some similarities to the Isofarian Guard, which I covered last week, and it, it kind of, for me, it played on the reverse. The Isofarian Guard I was super interested in, I jumped in, and the more I found out, the less I was interested in it. Versus Trudvang is a game that like I said, I wasn't interested in it, and then the more I found out, the more I was interested in it, but we'll come to that. So, let's start with the game. What is this game? Trudvang Legends, what is this game? Unfortunately, I'll note, unlike many of these videos that I try to prioritize late pledges, there is no late pledge for this one. It's too late. It's over. This is going to be shipping. I don't know actually when it's shipping out, but the late pledge is long gone for this one, so that's unfortunate, but I, yeah, I try to avoid doing these for ones you can't get your hands on, but I had requests for it, so I'm still going to do it now, I guess. In any case, Trudvang Legends is a game that it is ultimately, it is a narrative-driven experience, the, the way they pitched it. They have a storybook that you're going to flip through and pick different options. They have different cards that you'll choose. Do I burn the city? Do I free the villagers? There's a bunch of choices you're going to make. This is a choose-your-own-adventure, narrative-driven game. But one of the things that's interesting about the game is that it has this legend system. And this legend system is the idea that you see over here on this board where you can slot a card into this plastic shield on the board. Now, I don't know how it's going to play out from a production standpoint, how that's going to hold up. But they have this system where the boards have these little plastic sleeves, and you get to sleeve your cards into that into that plastic sleeve, which changes the game state. It's almost a cross between a typical board game and a seventh continent system, where you have this element of exploration and permanent change, but it actually can vary based off the choices you make. You might move into a square, and then you'll put a token, you'll put a card in that sleeve, and then as you do things, as you make choices, you might replace that card with something else. Maybe the village burned to the ground. Maybe a dragon came in and did whatever. It does does promise this this degree of, of a legend system of a permanent change to the board that things will change and and adjust over time and this is a game that has long-reaching consequences at least from the status of gameplay there'll be characters who age out and have an effect on the game as they they level up and eventually become some sort of higher level tier and eventually just move on but then they'll have effect on the system as you as you go along and situations or places you go to doing the game will potentially be for this generation it might have this certain effect but then for another generation, which might be game seven, I don't know what it'll be, but it might change totally. You might be like, well, this was the forest that we grew back here, but now it's been, you know, a city has come up instead. It has a, it's not a purely, you know, in this year story. It is a story with long reaching consequences as your characters age and progress throughout the game. And from the story stance, it doesn't pull me in that much, but it does a little bit. It does a little bit because of the fact that 
it has this aspect of seventh continent of pulling cards and whatever. It's totally not seventh continent, but I like the idea of a board that remembers itself. I like the idea of a board that you fold up, put back in the box, and it's all prepped to go with the changes you made. There's no logbook to pull out of being like, okay, well, we have to set up the game this way because that's where we left off. I mean, seventh continent has a great save system, but this is literally, it's not a save system. It's just the way, it's almost a legacy element to a game. The board is permanently changing but not permanently because you can reset it when you go through your next play. And in terms of the combat, because this is a big one, this is, a, as far as the game, it's a 1-4 to four player game, 14+, plus. ignore the 14+, plus. do what you want there, 60 minutes per chapter, which is, you know, reasonable if it actually is, which means this is the kind of game I can pull out and get to the table pretty easily, and I don't mind story-based games if they have enough going in there to drive me forward. When it's purely reading a story, it's really not for me. If, you, if there's enough going on, some have made it through my my resistance to that genre. In terms of the gameplay itself, the gameplay itself is primarily bag building. It's primarily a deck building game where you're going to let me see if I can find a good screenshot here. Let me see what I can find here. It's primarily a, a bag building game where combat is going to be throughout the course of the game. Here we go. Here's a good set of series. You're going to travel in the game. You're going to move to a new region and put the card in the system. You'll discover, you'll make choices and adjust the cards in the system. You'll, like I said, make a choice. Maybe you get this weapon, maybe you get that weapon. And you see those little icons on those cards over here? That's relevant because of the combat system in which you're going to be drawing runes from a bag that you slowly build out and putting them on those spots. So you might need certain runes to activate certain abilities on your weapons. You're going to cast your runes, draw runes in the bag, and check for successes. Now, this game has a push-your-luck system that the more you draw, the more it can be good for you, the more it can be bad for you. Honestly, this game is really just Quacks of Fredlinburg, but with a different theme. It's ultimately it's the exact same game. It's not really not in the slightest, but it does have bag building in a deck building system kind of with a push your luck mechanism. So that does have that similarity while being a totally different game past that. But you can see over here, enemies roam the land, draw your tokens from the bag to match them up to your cards and leave your mark in the world, putting it back in. So the, the game mechanics around this narrative experience are primarily around deck building and bag building, where you're going to try to build up your character, get your weapon. So it has an RPG element, it has a story element, and it has a bag building element that I do enjoy. Now, I will note because I have to point out the differences between last week's video and this week's video because the Isofarian Guards seem to have that as well, and so did this, ga this game. So what's the difference between Trudbang and the Isofarian Guard in terms of my decision to back one versus the other? And that's... Well, we'll come back to that shortly. But that's basically it. That, that past that, in terms of the pledge levels, let's talk about the pledge levels briefly. They just had a $90 early bird plus a $100 legendary pledge. They had, in terms of the, the all-in, the back, they had the adventurer set which is an all-in pledge $145 for this adventurer set gives you a decent amount of stuff obviously like most command games the base pledge gave you a much better deal for the amount you got but overall had you know this stuff as well so why did I back this game what was the what was the difference between this and the Isafarian Guard why did I walk into this game kind of expecting not to back it but then backing it in the end what changed along the way and there are a few things and we'll talk about all of those things to begin with the art style just grew on me I don't have an easy answer for you with that one, but day one, the miniatures, the art style, didn't do it for me at all, was not my kind of thing. I just wasn't pulled in. But the more we had these daily unlocks, let me see if I can find that. Here we go. The more we had these daily unlocks, the more this world slowly developed, the more I just started to appreciate it for being different. Meaning at first I didn't like it because it was different, but the more it went on, the more I actually appreciated it. Like some of these guys I still don't really like, some of these miniatures I'm still not a fan of, but it really had a flavor. Paul Bonner really brought to life this, this and it's from, it's based on Shredbang Chronicles, or RPG games, so it's not purely his own creation, but it really did work in terms of being its own unique Celtic kind of theme. I don't want to offend anyone if I say Celtic and it's really Norse or who knows what, but it has a feel that really each additional miniature brought out that feel for me. It, it had something unique and different that I really appreciated. And this is something we're seeing with Massive Darkness 2 right now, where Massive Darkness 2 is getting a lot of flack with the miniatures, but I like how they're different. I like how they be something new to the table and not just another version of the same old thing. And this game very much, as each stretch goal went out, it really did feel like it was bringing something new to the table and not just another version of the same old thing. You could see each of these miniatures. Look at how each one's different. Look at this mermaid on a little stone there. Look at these, this this Herm Frost Dragon. This is different than your typical thing. Look at this Jarn Worm, this Dark Dweller. This is a different feel than the typical miniature that you will get from, a, a, from this genre. And I... I appreciated it. It grew on me more and more over time. That early bird locked me in. If I if that hadn't been an early bird, I don't know how much attention I would have paid to this at the time. I probably would have looked in, but the fact that I was in the in the campaign, the fact that I had a pledge meant I got every single update and I liked the miniatures that were adding on. And that's all personal taste. 
Number two, and this is the easy one, unlike Us of Iron Guard, where I had concerns about the gameplay, and I have concerns about the gameplay in Trudvang as well, I do, but the difference is that Ice of Fair and Guard, I had concerns about the value as well. With Ice of Fair and Guard, I have no confidence. I'm not saying it won't be worth whatever, but I had no confidence that would hold its value. Based on their prior games, it's just, it was a risk I wasn't willing to take. I didn't know what the final product would be like. And it wasn't a miniatures heavy game too, which is a strike against it at the end of the day. I mean, it had the same price point as this game. That the Ice of Fair and Guard was basically sh just shy of being $90 for everything. There, It had a pledge level above $90, and yet it wasn't coming with this giant horde of plastic. And, and no disrespect to them, I understand that everyone's competing with different logistics, different scales, and I'm not trying to in any way uh, dismiss what they were bringing to the table. They were bringing a different kind of narrative adventure, but... This game, Trudvang, was offering a giant narrative adventure, along with a giant mountain of plastic, along with a track record of all their games just being worth the money that you pay. Come on, games historically hold their value. And so, yeah, this was a much easier decision to make, even with the concerns I have about the gameplay, and we'll come to that, but it just... From a value perspective, backing a Kaman game that I am on the fence about is a much safer bet for my wallet than backing another game I'm on the fence about. And so the Ice of Fair and Guard, while I'm still interested in it, I still am wondering if maybe I'm wrong with the Ice of Fair and Guard. Maybe it will be good. Versus with Trudbang, I'm kind of the reverse side. I think it will be good for me, but I'm wondering maybe I'm wrong. But either way, the value is there on a Kaman game. And this is something we've talked about, but like... Come on, delivers value. That $90 pledge is an easy back. That expansion, that $145 for all of this, that's a little bit more on the fence. There were some Kickstarter exclusive expansions in here, so it's probably a safe bet. Overall, going for that all-in pledge is almost certainly a safe bet. It does depend. I find that the base pledges will hold the value no matter what, versus the extras tend to be more of a factor of how well the game does. If the game is good, if it does well, these will be well worth what you paid for them. If it doesn't, then it's a little harder to know, but we'll see. Time will tell. In the end, I did, by the way, go for the all-in pledge. I was really not planning on it. Even up until the last three days of the campaign, I was like, I'm still on the fence. I have doubts. I'm just going to get the legendary pledge. It's an easy It's an easy buy. But I did go for the all-in at the end, primarily because of the Kickstarter exclusive stuff and because I do believe this game will be good and will hold its value. Perhaps not for me. I still have concerns about that. But for someone out there, I think this game is right for a large segment of the population, especially those that like narrative campaigns. Uh, and lastly, and this is the last reason why this one is opposed to Ice of Fair and Guard, which is the combat here felt more... It didn't feel significantly different. Than, I, I, I really shouldn't say that. The combat did not feel significantly different than Ice of Fair and Guard. Both of them seem to have weaknesses in the actual gameplay itself in terms of what it was bringing to the table from a gameplay stance. And I do have concerns about both. Where Ice of Fair and Guard did not give me the confidence, but, but, but Trudvang did, is towards the end of the campaign. And this is a campaign that saw a lot of drama in it because there were a lot of comments in there. There were a lot of complaining. If you pay attention to Quick, to Quick Track, Kick Track basically shows that the funding, they had negative funding days. That is bad. Having negative funding days, look at all these backers. Backers per day were just dropping out. This is one of the, 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 the I don't know how, how to say it, it was a panic button for Kaman. This thing was started off with, you know, obviously the Kaman backers, a bunch of people in, and then drop, 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 drop. It was bad. Look at all this. It's every single day people are dropping out, and a big part of that is early bird pledges. Early bird pledges tend to have that effect, because people jump in day one, just like I did, but then they drop out as the campaign progresses, as they think that there's less of a reason to be in. Now, the downside is people who want back in now have to pay a higher price, which is why I generally recommend holding your early bird till the end, set a reminder, because it's just not worth something changing, and things did change, it's not worth something changing and then being panicking about it. And that thing is that, that well, there were a few things, a few complaints people had, but one of them was just the stretch goals. When you have an early bird campaign, you have to plan for the fact that you're going to have a ton of stuff on lock day one, and then it's going to be a tiny creeping crawl throughout the campaign. And this campaign, come on, pivoted mid-campaign to start adding stretch goals to the campaign, because, not stretch goals, daily unlocks, because they realized this was bad. This was not going in the direction they wanted. This was a slowly creeping lower and lower it was dropping under a million at the point it ended at 1.5 and it just wasn't looking good for them and so they pivoted and started adding daily reveals and they still had the stretch goals and they managed to recover but it's definitely a model that is likely affected why even in massive darkness 2 today we're seeing that combination of daily stretch goals and a daily review daily reveals plus stretch goals and it's because of that it's because you can't have an early bird campaign with just stretch goals and not expect something like this might happen it very well might unless you can keep that hype going which they didn't then it's going to be a problem. 
But additionally, mid campaign when that when that whole thing happened, they also released this gameplay video, this Trudvine Legends Testimonials Gen Con video. I'll have a link in the comments down below. But this is a video that they released mid campaign that really did help for me solidify that there might be a good system here. I, I mean, I don't know for me whether it's a good system, but there might be an overall good system. And that's because this is a video full of people giving their testimonials of the campaign. And yes, I acknowledge 100% that you never really know. Okay, great. Well, these people liked it, but these are the people they caught on camera. What about all the people who didn't like it? Maybe they signed NDAs because I can't find a ton of negative reviews. I tried looking. I, at the time, I tried looking. And even now, before this video, I tried looking. I still can't find any real people who are like, I played this game. It sucked. It wasn't for me. It's terribly, horribly done. I couldn't really find that. And it could be they signed NDAs and agreed to be in this video. But... There were two things that really convinced me. One is in this video is Board Game Coffee. Board Game Coffee made a, made an appearance in this video. And I, I mean, they're a come on fanboy just like myself, but they tend to like the same come on games I do to a large degree. And they feature a decent clip in this video and they really seem to like this game. And their opinion, more so than the average gamer at the table, nothing against the average gamer, I just don't know whether their tastes align with my own. But Board Game Coffee's opinion really did help sway me. It really did become a factor. Additionally, this is another video which... Ignore the fact that this looks terrible, it does look terrible, but this is a great video that I highly recommend watching with some great content from someone who played the game, I mean, by he said he played it hundreds, over 100 times at the con, which if he did, kudos to him. But he has a lot of experience with the game, and again, he's coming at liking the same games I do. He likes Rising Sun, he likes Blood Rage, he likes other games that he says in this video that I can't recall. He also likes Arcadia Quest and I don't, but hey, no one's perfect. And so that's me. I'm not perfect. He's perfect. So in any case, these two videos, and I really recommend giving this video a shot, by the way. If you are on the fence, if you've backed Trudbang and you're on the fence about this game, this video will definitely help solidify that there is something good here. It does not mean it's a good game for you. One person's opinion is just one person's opinion. But generally, if you have a completely flawed product, then that will come out. You won't have a 23 minute long video about how much the guy liked the game when it's a completely flawed product. There's definitely something here and that helped convince me. And so that ultimately is why I chose to back this game in the end. It was a combination of being pulled in by the art, the value proposition, and ultimately I do have concerns. Like I said, that gameplay, both in Isofer and Guard and in, and in Trudvang, I am worried about the gameplay being deep or deep enough to be engaging. But unlike Isofer and Guard, I do like the legend system more here. I do feel that that's something more. I mean, I don't know what that Isofer and Guard story will play out, but I do think that Trudvang does offer the, the promise of a narrative system that I will enjoy, the promise of a narrative system that I will appreciate. Even Seventh Continent is not a game that I think is that heavy on gameplay, but it did narrative in a way that I liked. And so once you have narrative in a way that works for me, where I'm not trying to rush and, and run past every single paragraph, then I can, I can be pulled in. I can be pulled in by that if it's done right. I can be pulled in by a light set of mechanics if the narrative is done right. But like I said, historically, it has been a hard sell for me in terms of whatever. And that's basically it. In honor of the duck behind me, I will do a drop of flavor text. Just because I'm not singing. I'm not singing here, but a drop of flavor text. Shaken from the spectacle. Mei Ling's bow found his hands and his arrows flew. Fire exploded around the beast's heads and Ladana roared as she charged, sword in hand. But the bull's troll's hide was thick, and Mei Ling's arrows drew but scratches. The fire startled it, but it roared all the louder, singed but not burned. Ladana smashed into its buckling leg, but the beast held its footing and slashed with its horns. It bore the dwarf over. Mei Ling spotted an unconscious man in dark robes sprawled near the wood's edge. Looked like the vintner weaver he'd been seeking, but he had no time to contemplate the man's fate. Fellowing strumming began, discordant, sharp, and painful, but was directed at the beast laden with vintner. The cacophony struck the bull troll like a physical blow. It staggered back, eyes rolling, confused. And that's basically it. I don't, I just do flavor text a little bit. But that is actually a segment. If you like that, if in any way, if you appreciate it, not me, if you like the story. But this is, a, this is, they had a whole, throughout the updates, they had a whole system of the fortuitous adventure part one that kept going throughout the campaign and kept going after that. And I thought it was decently well written. I mean, in, in terms of whenever you have gameplay in a game, it's, you can, you can read a book, which has good gameplay, or you can play a game that promises to give you the experience that a good book will give you. And so often, I find writing in, in these games to be weak. I find it to be, they're trying to make a game and then shove narrative in there. I overall did like the reading the fortuitous adventure as the campaign progressed, and that is another factor that did work for me. I, I really liked it. Similar to with the Isofer and Guard, where I was actually really pulled in by the Foreteller app. In in this game, I did like the, the story that was being pitched, at least from whatever degree it was. That is basically it. That's my opinion of Trudvang Legends. That is why I backed Trudvang Legends. Again, I am Alice Radcliffe from Board Game Co. You can subscribe down below or let me know in the comments why you backed it, why you didn't back it, 
what were your thoughts? There was a lot of drama around this campaign. Like I said, you don't see negative numbers like this often. This was bad. Usually you see reduced growth when there's drama. This was straight up negativity, which was, it was a mess for them. But in the end, the campaign did do, did do well, and it has become a game that I'm pretty excited to get to the table. I think it'll probably be a solo adventure for me, more than a, you know, a two-player or whatever. But who knows? It depends ultimately on whether my wife enjoys it, whether I enjoy it. We'll see what happens and whether my friends enjoy it. There's all kinds of ways that this can hit the table. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe, and you can have a great whatever, I guess, weekend. This is probably Thursday. Have a good one.